Good morning, church. Do any of you guys know a man named Harold Camping? Does that name ring a bell? <laughs> Steve just kind of sighed a bit. A guy named Harold Camping, he's predicted the end of the world, I believe, now 12 times. One of his most famous predictions was on May 11th, 2011. I don't know if you remember that one. I remember it. There's billboards everywhere. But the sad reality for poor Harold is that each time his predictions have not come to pass. More recently, maybe you saw this, some believe that the, um, the eclipse was going to bring the end of days, but it didn't as well. What we see throughout history is humans are obsessed with the end of all things, right? You see stories, books, movies, TV shows, even a very popular song from 1987 that's focused on the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> but for all of these wrong predictions out there, there's one thing these guys all get right, that the end is coming, church. And whether it's tomorrow or 20,000 tomorrows from now, it's on its way. But what does that have to do with Ecclesiastes, right? We're in the book of Ecclesiastes. What does the end of all things have to do with Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? It seems like a good tie-in with vanity of vanities, doesn't it? Right? It's all vain anyway. We're all going to die, so what's the point? But that's not where we're going this morning, actually. What we need to ask ourselves is the reality of the end is coming. More importantly, I think what we're wondering about is, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with my life here today? And that's what we're going to wrestle with because this week is a special week. As you can tell, we've got stuff going on on these tables here. We're hosting a ministry fair, a chance for each of you to get to know the various ministries here at River of Life Church and for you to learn how you can connect with Plugin and serve alongside others here at the church. And so the question we're wondering is, how does the end of all things relate to me serving at River of Life? Well, actually relates quite a bit. But don't take my word for it. Let's let the Apostle Peter speak for himself. If you have your Bibles, look at 1 Peter with me. We're going to be in 1 Peter 4 this morning. We're going to have it up on here on the screen as well. I'm going to read for us 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. But if you could stand with me to honor the reading of God's word as I read for us 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. Our text says this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. Peter starts this section here with that very bold statement, the end of all things is at hand. The end is coming. Sooner or later, it's going to get here. This reality is certain, church. But I think what we struggle with here today is how to appropriately apply this reality. Do you know what I mean? Like some of us can go to the extreme of obsession on this topic. Like we read every end times theory out there on the internet, which is kind of a scary place to be. We study the book of Revelation and Daniel a little bit more than every other book in the Bible. Or maybe really the only books you have on your bookshelf are the Left Behind series. <laughs> maybe you even prayed a little bit harder or you even just cleared out your schedule on those potential doomsday dates just in case right? Just in case something happened. But I think most of us, we often tend to swing to the opposite extreme, don't we? We never really consider the return of Christ or the end of all things because we're too busy living for today. There's so many distractions that we need to deal with. Who has time to think about the end of all things? Now, Jesus does tell us in Matthew 6 to focus on today, doesn't he? He says that we don't need to be thinking about the future. Today has enough trouble. Focus on today. But then he also says this in Luke 21. In Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, he says this. He says, But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that that day, the end of all things, that come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. 
but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. You see, what Jesus is saying in Luke 21 is that you and I here as Christians within the church, we are called to have an awareness, a preparedness for the end of all things. So what does it mean for us as a church to be prepared for the end of all things? I mean, are we supposed to go build a fallout shelter in our backyard and stock up on enough canned goods for the next 40 years? Amen. I don't think that's what Peter's getting at here. And so before we unpack the ways that Peter does encourage us in our text to live in light of the end of all things, I want to draw your attention to our section of scripture. I want to help you see something really important. It's that phrase, one another. Do you see it there in the text? You're actually going to see it three times, and we're going to go over this in a moment. But whenever you see that term, one another, in the New Testament, it almost always refers to how Christians are supposed to act towards other Christians, how we're to treat or act towards one another. What Peter is saying is that in light of the end times, that you and I are to pay extra special attention to how we interact with those inside the church. Now, that doesn't mean we neglect the mission. We also know in light of the end of all things that we're also to go and make disciples of all nations, like Jesus tells us in Matthew 28. But what's interesting is I think we can sometimes, again, lean towards one end or the other. The fact is the life of a Christian should be marked by a healthy tension of gospel sharing and evangelism and life together within the body. That we dare not spend all of our time away from the church lest we get broken down by the world around us. That we neglect the glorious community of one another that we have here. But we also dare not just busy ourselves with countless church activities and events lest we neglect the mission field, our families, or the tasks to which God has called us. This is a tough tension we live in. We can't be so busy with church stuff that we're not able to disciple and train our children or our families or reach our neighbors with the gospel. We need both of these realities working together. Neither the mission nor the church should be neglected for the other. And neither should be missing from our lives, Christians. As we have had the chance to speak extensively, therefore, about the mission component. Sorry, I'm a former missionary. I talk a lot about missions here at the church. Today now is our chance to counterbalance that, to talk about, hey, how do we now come to church together to love, serve, and bless one another? Well, that's what Peter's going to tell us. First thing Peter tells us, though, is we need to be self-controlled and sober-minded. Look at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, because the end is coming, what should we do? We should be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. Peter calls us here to two internal attitudes or mindsets that we need to cultivate in light of the end of all things. Be self-controlled. The Greek word there, it means to actually be of a clear mind. It's the same word used in Mark 5 when they're talking about a guy who had been possessed by demons where he was under the control of demonic powers. Jesus cast those demons out and his mind became clear. It was free from that oppression. He was now self-controlled. For Christians, that's what we're called to be. We are called to be self-controlled, clear mindset, rational and reasonable, not cluttered, but clearly focused on Christ. But he doesn't just say be self-controlled. He also tells us to be sober-minded. That Greek word literally means that word sober means not drunk. Or another definition would mean keep your mind free from illusion. You're not a, a daydreamer dreaming of some reality that's not consistent with your current existence. This means our minds can't be filled with pollution from the world. They can't be distracted or controlled by anything other than Christ. So Peter tells us these are the two mindsets we're supposed to have in light of the end of all things. But then he makes this really curious claim at the end of verse 7. He says we're to be self-controlled and sober-minded for what purpose? For the sake of our prayers. Isn't that fascinating? That, that what he's saying here is that basically these two character traits, self-controlled and sober-mindedness, it affects your prayer life. That our attitudes and our character affects our prayers. That when we are out of control, when we are flippant, when we are irreverent, when we are distracted and caught up with things that are not of God, it does indeed affect our prayer lives. And I don't know about you, but I don't want anything negative affecting my prayer life. I need prayer. And I need prayer to work. 
And so I want sober-minded, self-controlled mindset so Jesus can continue to work within my prayers. But notice too, just how these two mindsets are vital for life within the church. I mean, for us to do life deeply, united, committed to one another, open and honest, we have to be a people that are self-controlled and sober-minded, don't we? Because I mean, think about this. I'm not gonna work through my sin struggles with someone who's not self-controlled because they may feel the need to go and tell everyone else, right? And it's really, really hard to do ministry together with someone that's not sober-minded. They're distracted with other things. You never really know what you might say that might get them angry or annoyed or busy with other things, right? And so for the benefit of one another within the church, we need to be a people that is marked by our self-control and our sober-mindedness. And if these are lacking in our lives, church, we need to pray, ask for Jesus to forgive us and give us the ability to be a sober-minded, self-controlled people. But the second thing he tells us in light of the end times is we're called to love one another. Look at verse eight with me. Above all, above everything else, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, as we've talked about this a little bit before here at church, the the word love doesn't always mean the same thing in the New Testament, right? For example, here in this verse, we would expect that Peter would use the Greek word phileo, which means brotherly love, right? Right? Because that's how we think of each other in the church, don't we? Actually in China, so I was a missionary in China for 10 years. In the Chinese church, they refer to each other as brother and sister when they talk to each other. So I would be Dustin Shongdi, right? They say the second thing. So brother Dustin, or this would be brother Steve or sister Mary, right? That's how they refer to each other within the church. But the Greek word here is not phileo. It's agape. Agape love is different. Agape love is stronger. It's a sacrificial, committed type of love. It's more than a friendship love. It's more than just an acquaintance love. Ships passing by each other each Sunday until we pass by again next Sunday. It's more than just a mutual affiliation love. Like, hey, I go to this church and you go to this church so we're, we love each other, right? Or I, I like Jesus and you like Jesus so we love each other. It's deeper than that. And so what we see here is this love, agape love, is it's, it's sacrificial. We give of ourselves for the betterment of others in the church. We sacrifice our time, our money, our lives to build one another up. But we also see that this love is a committed love, that we don't push away from the table at church when someone bothers us. We don't run when others start acting the way we don't want them to. We don't just keep the peace and keep quiet when we know someone's behaving in a way that they shouldn't be or is not glorifying to God. That's a committed type of love. Rather, instead what we see is because we are fully committed to one another with this type of agape love, what do we do? We push towards the table. We enter the fray. We confront one another in love because we know we're all in. It's kind of like marriage, do you know what I mean? Like, so when my wife and I, Andrew, and we got married, before we did premarital counseling, we we talked and we said, hey man, divorce isn't on the table. That's never an option in our lives. We're not gonna say, hey, but, but maybe we'll put that in case something goes sideways. No, it was not an option. And so in that space, we're fully committed to one another. And so when Andrew and I have a problem with each other, we can't just push away from the table because that divorce card's gone. It's not on, it's not an option. We have to work through things. Do you know what I mean? Like we can't run anywhere. We have to work through it. What if we saw church the same way? You know what I mean? Like what if we saw our commitment to church the same way? Because I'll be honest with you. Hey, if there's a theological problem with a group of believers, you need to step away. That's not a bad thing. But do you know the reason most people leave the church today? Has nothing to do with theology. It's preference, song choice service order, things like that. That is not agape love, church. That is not a committed love. What if we said, hey man, divorce from the church is not an option. I'm in. What would we do in light of that? You see, I think we'd push towards the table more. I think we'd enter in and say, hey, we gotta work through this because we got nowhere else to go. We gotta figure this out. And what Peter tells us is that's the type of love that covers a multitude of sins. 
that when we love one another within the church with this type of love that's sacrificial and committed, that we are able to forgive and overlook another's offense. Now, this doesn't mean we don't hold each other accountable. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think we're better able to hold each other accountable correctly because now my holding you accountable isn't about me anymore. It's not about my comfort or my ease. It's about your good. And therefore, we love this way. Now, some of you are here today and you're thinking, well, that sounds really nice, but that's not reality. I've been in church before. People don't love like this. Things break down. And you know what? This is too good to be true. You're absolutely right, which is why this is impossible for us to share this love with each other until we comprehend, receive, accept, and live in the reality that this love is ours in Christ. Look with me at 1 John 4. 1 John 4, 19. This short little verse should be just stamped in your memory right here. We love, we agape, we agape one another in this way. Why? Because Christ first loved us. Because he first sacrificed himself for us with this committed type of love. Now, because I'm resting in that reality, church, I can do that with you. But you can't do it with other people until you've done it with Christ first. And you can't do it with other people until you continually pray through, rest in, and trust in that reality. In light of the end of all things, Peter says, let us love one another with a sacrificial, committed, agape love because Christ loves us with that type of love as well. But the third thing he tells us in our text is we need to show hospitality to one another. Look at verse nine. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. To be hospitable, and basically means to be a welcoming person, right? But in the first century, this idea of being hospitable would have been even more necessary and extensive. Because during this time, your preachers, your pastors were often traveling preachers and evangelists. And so they would go from town to town. And when they came to your town to share the good news or talk to you about the, the word of God, they would need a place to stay. They would need a meal. They would need you to provide for them. Now, today, this looks a bit different. I have a home. I have food to eat. And so you don't need to worry about that unless you want to have me over for steak dinner. I'm cool with that. But what this means now is we've adopted this to our modern day and say, we just need to be a welcoming people. We need to be a church that welcomes other Christians. I remember when I was in China, there wasn't a lot of Christians around. And so when you met a Christian man, you were stoked. It was like the most exciting thing. No way. You're a Christian. Guess what? We're best friends now. Like you and I have nothing in common, but because there's no other Christians in a 20 mile radius, we're best friends. That's that. Therefore, church, we, we welcome one another. This is why we have a hospitality team. We have greeters. We have people that are like, man, I'm, I'm excited you're here. I'm excited you're here because I just, I love being with other Christians on Sunday. This is why we do that greeting time. This isn't a time for us just to kind of catch up on the week. This time, be like, man, praise God you're here with us today. We're so thankful you came to worship with us. We're excited you're here. This is why we invite other people to meals. I love our seniors ministry. They do such a good job of this where they just, they're always going out together to eat. We, we welcome people into that. Hey, you're, you're new at the church. Let's go eat together. This is why we, we invest our time into each other. We open our homes, right? We say, hey, come on over. Do life deeply with my family. You love Jesus. Let's do that together. We are a welcoming church precisely because the end is on its way. But notice he says also that we're to do this without grumbling. You don't give up your time, your food, your, your spare bedroom begrudgingly. That's not welcoming. We don't invite others over or we don't stand up during greeting time and go, oh, I gotta go shake someone's hand. Does that bless anyone? Now, introverts, I hear you, okay? I get it. It's not my natural bent either. I tend to be that person that sits in the back and says, oh, please don't let anyone come talk to me. Please don't let anyone talk to me. <laughs> but is that hospitable? No, and we're called the hospitality church. And so guess what? Even you introverts, you have the capability because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you to stand up and make someone feel welcome. You do. The Holy Spirit can work that in you. In light of the end of all things, church, we need to be hospitable to one another, welcoming, friendly, 
focused on Christ. But the last thing he tells us is we're to use our gifts to serve one another. Verses 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now this final point here in our text, it's the one I really wanna camp out on this morning because this is the text that kind of motivated this ministry fair we're doing today. He says, if you have a gift, use it to serve others. But that's not right. He didn't say, if you have a gift. He says, rather, as each one has received a gift. Church, that's a really important distinction. You see, sometimes we just think, if you have a gift, use others to serve people. No, no, no. Peter says, if you've re- as you've received a gift, use it. And this is so important because whatever gift you have, whatever talent, whatever skill, whatever ability, whatever knowledge, whatever possession, whatever you have that makes you uniquely you, that thing, you've received it as a gift. It was given to you. You're good with numbers? Well, praise God, that was God's gift to you. You're a handyman. You're good with tools or fixing things. Well, praise God, that was his gift to you. You're a naturally welcoming, friendly, outgoing person. Well, praise God, that was his gift to you. You're musically talented. You're technically inclined. You're able to take care of things that other people can't. Praise God, that's his gift to you. All things that make you who you are, those are all gifts from our good creator. And if that's the case, how can we not use those things for one another? Do you know what I mean? Like, how can we possibly so audacious to think that we would use our gifts not for one another? How can we think that our skills and our abilities, they're just meant for us and our pursuits or our families or our friends or our jobs? God gave you whatever gift you have for the church, my friend. That's why he gave it to you. He gave them to you for a purpose beyond just you and your plans. And he says, that's to serve one another. Because that's what we do as a good steward. You see there again in verse 10. We're to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. A steward is someone who cares for something that is not their own. They care for their master's possessions and belongings. So again, think of that gift you have, that ability, that skill, that knowledge, that talent that makes you uniquely you. That thing, that's not yours. It's not yours. You don't get to take it with you. That thing is God's. He has loaned it to you for a time right now for you to use it. And one day that thing is going back to him. And so the question you need to ask yourself this morning is are you being a good steward of that gift that he has given you? Are you properly using the gift God has given you for the purpose of serving other Christians? And maybe you're not. Maybe you've been on the sideline. Maybe you're new here. You don't know how yet. Or maybe you've been here for 30 years and you're not sure how to start. Today is an invitation for you to start. There's so many different ways for you to engage with us and use your gifts to serve and build others up. Again, if you're good with tools, we've got a building table over here. A chance for you to let us know what you're good at. So when something breaks, we know who to call. Maybe you're, you love kids and you love to work with kids. We've got our kids ministry table in the back and our trail life and our Camp Lebanon, man. They, they wanna come around and work with you to, to reach those kids with the gospel of Jesus. Maybe you're friendly and you like to meet people. Well, praise God, our, our hospitality team wants to hear from you. They'd love for you to be on the front lines of welcoming people in here at the church. Maybe you're serious about Bible teaching. You love the Bible and you want to teach others about it. Come see the small group table. We got training coming up this summer. We'd love to get you connected and thinking about how to plug in and even maybe lead a Bible study in the future. You're passionate about young adults. You want to help them grow into men and women of God. You love men's ministry. You love to come around inside other men and help them grow together. You want to speak into women or young moms. You love blessing our seniors. Check these ministries out today. As God has given you a gift, church, actively use it for the blessing and benefit of one another. And so I want to close our time down today as Peter does in verse 11. Look with me at verse 11 again. 
Again, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Hear this. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Church, our desire is for everyone in this room, first and foremost, to have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord, Savior, and the treasure of your souls. But then as you, you comprehend the, the massive awesomeness of Christ and you would treasure him as you ought to, our desire then is that you would live on mission and have an active and thriving relationship with Christ's body, the church. Why do we want that? Why do we desire that for you? Again, right there in verse 11. So that in order that in everything that you do and we do and collectively we do as a church, that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That's why. We desire that Jesus Christ, our great rescuer and redeemer, may be exalted in how we live individually and collectively. Because all dominion, all power, all honor, all glory, it's all his. It all belongs to him. And church, when you see that, when you get that glimpse of Christ, when you apprehend just how incredibly awesome, massive, majestic he is, you can't help but connect, plug in, and serve. We won't be able to stop you from doing it. And so my admonition to you is keep your eyes on those two massive realities that we opened and closed with here today. That all glory, honor, and power rightly belongs to our God. And that the end is on its way. If you hold on to those two realities, you ask yourself this question. In light of that, how am I going to live today? Our hope and prayer is that you will live on mission. Making disciples and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ out there. But then you would also connect get plugged in and serve one another in this room for the upbuilding of God's glorious church.